Welcome, my name is Terry Soul, and this is Programming Chaos, a channel devoted to fun and interesting programming projects to help you hone your programming skills. For today's project, I'm gonna be programming a genetic algorithm. So genetic algorithms are optimization algorithms that are based on biological evolution. The basic idea is evolution has done a fantastic job of evolving all sorts of complex creatures that are well adapted to their environment. Why can't we take that same idea and apply it in computer science? So in order to understand how these algorithms work, we need to think a little bit about what components go into biological evolution. And biologists have formulated this in a number of different ways. The one I like most has four major components. So if we think about biological evolution, the first thing we need, the first component, is a population of individuals, right? The things that are evolving. And what sort of goes along with those is each individual, each organism has a genome and it has a fitness. And then the second component is based on that fitness, we have selection, sort of our survival of the fittest. The third component we need is some form of inheritance. So when an individual reproduces, it passes its genes, its genome onto the next generation. And the fourth component we need is variation. And typically in a genetic algorithm, we put in that variation in two ways, a model of sexual reproduction, often referred to as crossover, where we do some crossing of genes between two parents, and then a random mutation. So with those four components, a population of individuals, a selection mechanism, a way to do inheritance where DNA is passed from parents to offspring and variation, we have an evolutionary algorithm. So that's one of the interesting things about these algorithms. They actually turn out to be fairly simple to code and they can be applied to almost any optimization problem that you're dealing with. So with that in mind, let's sort of sketch out how our algorithm will look. Our algorithm begins with a population of individuals, and it can be helpful to think of these individuals as potential solutions. So each individual is a potential solution to whatever problem we're trying to solve. And each individual has associated with it its genome or DNA, which is represented as an array of numbers, and a fitness, which is basically a measure of how well that individual solves whatever problem it is that we're trying to solve. And once we have these fitnesses, then we can do selection and we select what we think of as parents based on their fitness. This is a somewhat stochastic process. So we don't always just want to select the very best individual because then our population will have no diversity and the evolution will basically grind to a halt. So when we're doing selection, we're going to include a stochastic component. So we select on average better individuals, but not just the best individual. And as you'll see, I'm gonna code something that's known as tournament selection, which tends to work fairly well. Once we've selected two individuals, which we can think of as parents, then we have to do our crossover operation. And that involves taking genes, represented by numbers from one individual's genome and swapping it with genes from the other individual's genome. So basically taking part of each of these solutions and mixing them. Then we'll put in a mutation operation, which just takes a value and randomly changes it a little bit. And then in the model that I'm coding, which is known as a generational model, we'll take these two new individuals, which are basically we can think of as offspring of the parents, and we put them in the next generation. So we're doing one distinct generation at a time. Repeat this process until my new population is full, that is the next generation is created. And to make the programming a little easier, it's typical to use a fixed size population so we know when it's full. And then we simply repeat the process. And so we take our new generation and start over by selecting parents, applying crossover, applying mutation, and so forth. So as I said, the evolutionary algorithm itself is fairly straightforward. If we think in terms of code, it, we can start to see the data structures that we'll need. Our population of individuals will simply be an array because we have a fixed size population. 
and the individuals themselves I'll represent as objects, so I'll create an individual class, and those objects will have, for example, their DNA and their fitness associated with them. Okay, so with that model in mind, let's start the programming. I'm going to be programming this in Java using the processing environment, and so the code I have here is sort of processing boilerplate. We start with a setup and size creates our window that the code is going to run in, and then we have a draw loop, and of course we've got to fill in lots more of the code. But I'm going to start by creating my individual class. So as I said, I want a population of individuals. So with processing, you often create your classes in a separate tab, which I've done here. Each individual, as we've seen, needs to have a fitness associated with it and a genome to store its DNA, so we can put that in. And the genome will just be an array, in this case, of floating point values. And we need to define how many genes an individual has. So I'm going to go in and add just a number of genes. And for this simple example, I'll keep it short. I'm going to say our creatures only have four genes. Now we need a constructor to construct individuals. The genome is just an array of floating point values, and now we have to fill in our initial random values. And the range of those initial values depends entirely on the problem you're solving. So I'm just going to put in here a sort of fairly small initial range from minus 2 to 2. Now that we've put in those initial random genetic values, we can calculate the fitness. And I'm putting that in as a separate function because we're going to have to calculate fitness fairly regularly every time we generate new offspring. For this example, I'm going to use a very simple fitness function. I'm going to be adding together all the genetic values. And the fitness function is really the heart of any genetic algorithm because it's what measures how good an individual is at solving whatever problem it is that you want to solve or optimizing whatever set of parameters you want to optimize. Quite often, the fitness function is very complicated. It might be a whole simulation where you take these values and design a robot based on them and then run the simulation to see how well the robot does. Or it might be historical stock market data where you're trying to optimize a portfolio to give you the best return for the least risk. In this case, I'm, because I'm just doing this as an example, I'm keeping my fitness function very simple and just adding together the genetic values. However, that is a little too easy, so I'm going to add one twist just to make the evolutionary process a little more difficult. And that is, I'm going to say the fitness is the absolute value of that sum. So this does something a little bit interesting. Basically, our genome consists of four values that at least initially are in the range minus 2 to 2. So we might have you know, minus 1.5 and plus 0.9. And if you add those together, they sort of cancel each other out, which means that having a mix of negative and positive values is not going to be evolutionarily very successful. However, because I'm taking the absolute value and what we're going to try and do is maximize fitness, that means that having lots of large positive values is good, but so is having lots of small negative values. So having negative twos, for example, is good. And this leads to a condition known as epistasis. So the idea behind epistasis is that you cannot measure the fitness value of a gene by itself. I don't know whether a negative two is a very good value of or a very poor value because it depends on what the other values are. If they're also all negative, then that negative 2 is good because it gives me a larger overall number. However, if the other values are all positive, then that negative 2 subtracts for them and is disadvantageous. So epistasis is this notion that you can't look at a value by itself and know whether it's a good value or a poor value. A not great analogy, but it sort of gets the point across, is can we say that having lungs is advantageous or not? 
Well, it depends on the rest of the organism. If you also have scales and flippers and are adapted to live underwater, then having lungs is not very useful. What you really want is gills and vice versa. If the rest of your body is adapted to being on land, then having lungs is useful and having gills would be counterproductive. So by adding the absolute value here, we're adding a very simple form of epistasis, which will make the evolution a little bit more complicated. The next thing I want to do is display my individuals. And in this case, my individuals are just a set of numbers. So I'm going to print the fitness and then I'm going to print each of those gene values just so we can see the process of evolution as it takes place. So let's put in that display function. I'll need to know sort of where to put the number. So I want to arrange all of my individuals in my window so that we can see them. So I'm going to pass the display function, the X, Y location that the individual should be displayed at. There we go. That's going to display the fitness for me. And then I also want to display the genomic values, the genes, if you will. So that will display the individual gene values and this little bit of math here with the Y is just to get each gene value printed below the one before it. So with that, I can now create an individual and display it. So this creates an individual, calls the constructor to give it its genome and then displays it. And I'm getting an error message because these should be integers. So let's do width divided by two instead. There we go. And so there's my first random individual. It happens to have a fitness of 4.825. And these are the genetic values. And if we do another one here, so this has a mixture of positive and negative values. So I've got a positive 1.9, but I'm subtracting from that this negative 1.1. And so overall the fitness is lower because I have this mix of positive and negative values. So that's that epistasis taking place. And it occurs to me, I think this might be a little bit, look a little better if it was center aligned. So I'm going to toss that into my setup as well. There we go. And so here we've got an individual that's mostly negative values. We put those together and then add in a positive value, but the sum is still, because we take the absolute value, this is a pretty good fitness, at least initially. Here we can create and display an individual. Now we have to go in and add the rest of the evolutionary algorithm. The first thing I want to do is actually get rid of my individual and replace it with a whole population, which as I said, is going to be an array of individuals. So let's get rid of my individual here and instead create a population of individuals. And I'm going to define a population size of 16. 16 is fairly teeny for an evolutionary algorithm. And certainly it's teeny for a biological population, but it allows us to sort of display the whole population at once. Once we have the basic code, if you want to expand upon it, you're going to want a much bigger population size. So that will fill my population with new individuals, and then I might as well display them all to make sure this is working properly. So this part looks a little weird, but I need to tell each individual where to display itself. So I'm going to take the number of the individual, divide by four and take the remainder, and then multiply that by the width of the window divided by five. So basically the first four individuals will all be put in a row with spacing between them based on the width divided by five. And then I do the same sort of thing for the Y value, but now I want them down. So I'm instead going to divide by four. And the reason this works is because my population size is 16. So I'm doing four across and then four rows down would be maybe a little better instead of dividing by four here to divide by the square root of the population size. But really, you almost certainly won't want to try and display the whole population this way. If you have a population of, say, a thousand individuals, which is much more reasonable, probably won't be able to fit them all in the window anyway. You're going to instead want to do something like only display the best one in each generation.
But this works for setting up the evolutionary algorithm, which can then be expanded upon. So let's close that loop and see how this works. So there we go. Here's my population of 16 individuals. Each one has a fitness and a set of genes. And looking through them, we have some individuals that lucked out, if you will, and were assigned all positive genes and so end up with a pretty good fitness. We should have, if things worked out, well, here's one with mostly negative genes, although one positive. So that brings the, the overall fitness down quite a bit. But we have our population, and from this population, we can now do our selection and crossover and mutation to create the evolutionary algorithm. And so the first thing I'm going to do is just create my generation function as part of that draw loop. So this function, which I still need to code, of course, is going to create the next generation for me. The first thing I'm going to do is create a temporary population that represents the next generation. There's my temporary population representing the next generation. And I'm going to go through my population two at a time, selecting two parents and applying crossover and mutation to those parents. Pop size should have a capital S there. So the next thing I need to do is select two parents. So I'm going to say P1 and P2 are the indices of the two parents, and I'm going to use a selection function to do that. I haven't written that function yet, of course, and I'm going to write it as what's known as tournament selection. But before I get to the parent selection, I want to fill in the rest of the generation so it'll make a little more sense. So what I'm doing here is in my temporary population, I'm creating a new individual and that's reserving enough space in memory for the fitness in the genome. And then I'm actually going to copy that first parent into that location. And I'm going to write my own copy function because an individual is an object with a fitness and then a genome, which is an array. And I don't always trust Java's sort of deep copy to do all of that copying correctly. So I'm a little more conservative and just write my own copy function that I know works well. This gives me my first parent, and then I'll do the same thing to copy over the second parent, except that the second parent goes into the next location in the temporary population. And this is my second parent. There we go. So in the temporary population, the idea is I've picked two good, above average, probably, individuals for my population, and I've copied them into location i and i plus 1 in the temporary population, and now I can cross over between them and apply mutation and recalculate their fitness. I'm going to put that in for now just as comments. So the idea is I'm going to do crossover between i and i plus 1. And then I need to calculate their new fitnesses. And because the calculate fitness function is already written, I'll go ahead and put that into the code. And then the last thing I'll need to do is copy my temporary population back into my regular population to repeat the process with my evolutionary loop. So I can't run this yet until I've at least filled in the parent selection function and the my copy function. So let's start with the parent selection function. As I said, I'm going to be doing tournament selection. And the idea behind tournament selection is we select n individuals at random from the population and the best of those, the one with the highest fitness, gets to be the parent. Tournament selection has some nice advantages. It's fairly simple to code, and you can change the amount of selection pressure by changing how many individuals you're randomly selecting. That is to say, changing the tournament size. A bigger tournament means you have to have a higher fitness in order to win the tournament. There's more pressure to be highly fit. And it turns out typically fairly small tournament sizes work pretty well. So I'm just going to use a tournament size of three. And then what I'm going to do is pick a random individual. And for now, I'm going to declare it the winner. 
And then I'm going to pick a couple of other individuals and see if they're better. And if they're better, I'm going to replace the winner with those better individuals. But in order to do that, I do need to know the fitness of the current best individual. So I called it winner. We could call this current best instead. That might be clearer, but I'll stick with what I have. So as I said, the winner represents the best so far, and then I need to pick, in this case, two other individuals to compare to the winner to see if they're better. And so that's why, a little unusual, I'm starting with i equals one here. So temp here is the next individual who's competing in the tournament. And let's see, missing a square bracket, there we go. So again, if the fitness of that temporary individual is better than the best fitness, except that I called this best fitness, then the winner becomes that temporary individual and the best fitness becomes the fitness of that temporary individual. And then at the end, all we have to do is return that winner. And let's see. Fitness is not a function, and I badly misspelled tournament size. That looks better. So the last thing that I need to do in order to run this iteration of the code is to put in the myCopy function that copies one individual into another individual. So I'll put that into the individual class. And all that does is copy the values from my source into the current individual. So the fitness value. And then also copy all of those genome values. And so now we can actually run this. We don't have crossover mutation, so we're not gonna get very good evolution, but we'll at least get the first part of it. Let's come back here to my draw loop and uh, I see an error and that's because I called my function select parent and up here I called it parent select. So let's swap this. That solves that problem. And if I run the code, well, let's take a look at it. So there's a little bit of a blur there, and then everything settled down to the same fitness, 3.990, and everything has the same genome. And the reason for that is we now have selection. We're selecting good individuals to become parents, and we're copying them to their offspring, but we don't have any variation. So all that's really happened is we've basically taken probably the best individual in the initial population, and it has now filled the whole population. And to see that a little better, we can turn the frame rate down. So I'll just do one frame per second. And now we start with random values, but the 4.591 quickly dominates the whole population. So this is what happens if you have a population and selection and inheritance, right? They're inheriting their parents' genes, but no variation. The population immediately converges on probably the best individual in the population. So that's why we, it's important that we add our crossover and mutation functions. Okay, so let's do that. So for crossover, I'm going to take the ith individual in my temporary population and I'm going to cross it with the ith plus one individual. And I need to go in and define that crossover function, so let's do that. And I'm going to call the second individual here p2 because really it's the second parent, if you will. So what I'm gonna do is go through the entire genome and with a random probability, swap the two genes between the individuals. This is what's sometimes referred to as uniform crossover because there's a uniform probability of swapping any two genes. Within the field, sort of the study of genetic algorithms, there's a number of different crossover operations that have been introduced and experimented with and different ones work better or worse depending on the problem you're trying to solve and how you've arranged the genes, those values in your genome. But the differences are not super large. So picking one way to do crossover, in this case uniform crossover, and just using it will usually give you pretty good results. It's only if you really want to optimize your algorithm that you start playing around with other forms of crossover. So, like I said, this is uniform crossover. I just have a probability of choosing to swap the two genes.
So I'm going to say if a random value between 0 and 100 is less than that probability, and somewhat arbitrarily, I'll set the probability at 40%. So I have a 40% chance of choosing to swap two genes. And so now I just have to do the swap. And this is the standard way of swapping two values. So I'm remembering in my temporary value the genomic value for my first parent, and then I can replace that with the value from my second parent, and then the second parent's gene gets that temporary value that I was remembering. And now I should also put in my mutation. So let's go over here. Now that I've done crossover, I can mutate both of these individuals. And I'm going to mutate them, of course, individually, because unlike crossover, that doesn't require two parents. And just like with crossover, and for that matter with selection, there are lots of different ways to do this. I'm going to pick a fairly simple one, which is to randomly pick one of my four genes and just change it by a little bit. And that's in some sense a very high mutation rate, right? Out of only four genes, one of them is always being mutated but it works fairly well for this problem. So I need to pick the gene first, and then I need to mutate it. So there we go. Pick a random gene and change its value by a little bit randomly. It's important to point out that in both crossover and mutate, these are clearly random functions, and that means a lot of the time, maybe even more than half the time, they're gonna make things worse. So if I have an individual that is evolving large positive values and I randomly mutate a gene to be smaller, that's going to make it a little bit worse. That's kind of unavoidable. We don't know in advance which way mutation should go. That's the whole point. We just have to apply a random mutation and know that sometimes it'll make things worse, sometimes it'll make things better, and in the cases where it makes things better, i.e. it improves fitness, selection will then favor those individuals. And with this, we have our evolutionary algorithm running. So let's give it a shot. So again, I turned the frame rate down so we can see these values slowly changing over time. And in this case, it looks like they're selecting all positive genetic values. And if you look at the fitnesses, at each iteration, they go up by a little bit. And that's a combination of selecting the better individuals and then applying crossover and mutation and then selecting the better individuals again. And so there are some fluctuations. If I were to pause this, you'd see occasionally values go down and get worse. But on average, we get this increasing fitness. I'm going to run this again. And I'm hoping to get a case where it favors the negative genetic values. It doesn't look like that's happening here, right? It quickly resolves to where these are all positive in this case. Let me try it one more time just to see what happens. So definitely starting with some negative values. Ah, and finally I got lucky. And here you can see it's evolved so that it's using all of the negative values only. But because I take the absolute value, that get, does give me large and increasing fitness values. Okay, so now that that's all working, it's worth stepping back a little bit and thinking about the code for just a minute because this is the whole optimization algorithm. If we have a different problem that we want to apply it to, there's only a few things we need to change. We probably need a different number of genes and we certainly need a different way of calculating the fitness. But the rest of the algorithm pretty much remains unchanged. It's just a population of individuals that are sets of numbers. We figure out how good they are as potential solutions, apply our selection and crossover and mutation. So let me show an example of that with a more interesting problem. Here we have a population of individuals that are evolving to race around a track. The genetic algorithm is basically exactly the same as the one we just looked at, but of course the fitness function is quite a bit more complicated because it involves simulating the racetrack and measuring how far the individuals get that becomes their fitness. Interestingly, in this particular case, they're still evolving only four genes. So the way that the cars move 
is they have these sensors that sense whether they're touching track or grass. And so that's two of their genes, basically the angle between the sensors and the length of the sensors. And then based on whether they're touching track or grass, there's a gene that tells them how hard they should turn. And then the final gene is how fast they should go. So those four genes define their movement. And as you saw at the beginning, I start with them random. So half the cars were going backwards and a few still begin by going backwards, but the rest selects for them to go forward and to go faster and faster over time. And there's again, an epistatic trade-off here. So if they go too fast, then they're gonna run off the track and get stuck in the grass, as you can see happening here unless their turn is sharp enough or their sensors are wide or long enough. And so all of those have to be properly balanced in order to get a good fast behavior out of them. And so you see over time, the speed tends to increase because getting around the track faster gives you a higher fitness, but the angle of the sensors and the degree of the turn keeps changing as it tries to get those correct for a particular speed. You'll also notice that the turn is often negative, which feels a little odd, but that's because the sensors can either have a positive angle or they could evolve to have a negative angle. And so if you have a negative angle, then you end up wanting a negative turn. You'll also notice this individual represents the fastest, excuse me, the best, the most fit individual from the previous generation. Usually it's the fastest, but not always because quite often the fastest individual will run into the grass. And so the speed does not always go up. It fluctuates in order to get the best behavior. So again, a complicated fitness function, really, it's not as simple as just set the speed as high as possible, because unless you also have your sensors at a reasonable angle and a reasonable length and a decent turn speed, you're just going to go flying right off the track. So, Let's speed this up a little bit and see how well they evolve. Okay, they're zipping around pretty quickly now. One of the things you'll notice is we never get to the point where none of them go off the road. That's not really how evolution works. It's always adding mutations and crossovers and in a sense testing the boundaries of what is a good solution. So in any generation we expect and in a sense we hope to see some of them go off the track because that means evolution is searching for better and better solutions and in the process occasionally gets ones that fail, which is fine, that's the way it should work. Of course, this problem could be made a lot more complicated. There's no acceleration, they're going at a constant speed. They cannot look ahead and for example, say, well, I know that I'm gonna to need to turn, so let's start turning earlier. They only turn when their sensors sense that there's something in front of them. So we could make this a much more complicated problem by adding more sensors, more behaviors, and increasing, therefore, the size of the genome, the number of genes. But again, the evolutionary algorithm itself would be exactly the same, selection, crossover, mutation. Okay, let's look at another example. Here we have an evolutionary life version of a genetic algorithm where the creatures are running around a simulated environment, in this case trying to collect food, and we have an implicit fitness function in that if they collect enough food they get to reproduce. These are much more complicated creatures. They actually have 30 different genes that control things like the shape, all those little spikes, their behavior, how they move, what color they are, how they respond to food and the environment and so forth. And we can see there are lots of different creatures running around. If you're interested in coding something like this yourself, I do have a set of three videos that step through the whole process, including creating the environment, the creatures, and the evolutionary algorithm. You can also use evolutionary algorithms to evolve opponents in video games. So we've developed two video games, Darwin's Demons and Project Haster, 
in which the opponents evolve as the game is going on. Each wave in these games represents one generation in our genetic algorithm. And at the end of a wave, the opponents that have done the best job of attacking the player are the ones that get to pass their genes on to the next generation. So Darwin's Demons, free on Steam if you want to check it out, is an arcade style game. And Project Haster, also free on Steam, is a combination of a tower defense real-time strategy game. And the cool thing about including an evolutionary algorithm is over time the opponents are evolving specifically to defeat the player's strategy. So if, for example, in Project Haster, you really like the flamethrower towers and you build nothing but flamethrowers, within a few generations, your opponents are going to be evolving fire resistance and simply overrun your defenses. And so you constantly have to be updating your approach in response to the evolutionary process, which is trying to defeat whatever approach you're taking on. The other really cool outcome is that the opponents that you're facing change in unpredictable ways. So this is an example of a few of the different creatures that you might see in Project Haster. They're all based on the same underlying model, but the genetics of the individual affect things like their color, how many limbs they have, the scale of the limbs, the overall scale of the creature, what their resistances are. So as the game goes on, you see unique creatures that maybe nobody else who's played the game has ever faced because these are one that specifically evolved in response to your gameplay. A major advantage of genetic algorithms, as I mentioned before, is that the basic algorithm is fairly simple, but it can be applied to almost any problem that you want to optimize. It's just a matter of defining potential solutions in terms of a genome, and then writing a fitness function that preferentially selects for the solutions that are closest to whatever outcome you want. So, Lots of very cool things that you can do with evolutionary algorithms. Have fun and happy programming. Thank you.